Well, hi, everybody. Thank you, first of all, uh, Jody, for inviting me to be with you today. And thank you, Gene, for allowing me to share this uh, morning with you. First, some things we need to appreciate that uh, notwithstanding the fact that the highest concentration of poverty in America is single older women. Got that? However, the highest concentration of extreme wealth in America is single older women. So we first have to hold this in our mind, that is it conceivable that there are older people that are struggling, that are impoverished, that are vulnerable? Absolutely. However, they are the richest segment of American society by a mile. So if you look at the average net worth, I love the fact that everybody wants to create businesses and technology and such for young people. Young people are broke. <laughs> broke and really hurting financially. Their moms and grandmom are flush, relatively speaking. Now this is interesting. This is an astonishing fact that we just landed on last week. We looked at the, not the assets to be invested, but the household wealth of people over the age of 65 versus people and households headed by people under 35. And how many of you are surprised to know that people over 65 have more household wealth than younger people? Okay, so you think it's about two times as much wealth? No, yeah, that's wrong. It's not five times, it's not 10 times. 21 times more wealth than people under 35. The other thing we have to appreciate is that they're already active consumers. 53% of all airline expenditures, 58% of new cars and trucks, 56% of lodging, eye care services, 66%, 66% of accounting fees, 84% of political donations. Let's be clear about what just happened in the election. 85% of magazine prescriptions and subscriptions. And in terms of the financial community, 76% of the entire net worth of America is held by people over 50 and 78% of all the retirement accounts. So, I know I've only got a couple of minutes here. I'm gonna just add a couple of more pieces. The other thing to keep in mind is they have more time affluence than any group in America and any group in history. To find yourself with five or 10 or 15 or 20 years of free time, there will be two and a half trillion hours of leisure time to be filled by boomers in the next 20 years. And the body changes as we age. And most people only stand little, understand little bits and pieces of it. So for example, you look at the rise of arthritis in the ankles and knees and you think, okay, so we'll make pain medication or an app so that if you fall down. But what about the fact that only 2% of the US housing stock is designed for people who have trouble with steps? Couple of zones that I think are worthy of attention. Everything having to do with health. There's how we want to feel and look and function and how we will feel and look and function. And it's everything from self-care and wellness to fitness to spas to artificial joints to uh, immune therapies to uh, you know diagnostic technologies to robotic procedures. I mean, it's just anything and everything you can think of is about to come alive. Also, the world of anti-aging. What will people do and spend their own money on, whether it's a spa or a nutrient drink or a phytochemical or a vitamin or a new lotion for their face? What will they be bamboozled into spending money on? How will they know what works for them? Food and beverage. Here's where the big opportunities are. I know everybody wants to think about a tech app around health, but food and beverage. For example, the food industry is organized around young people and their lives, their day parts, they're called. So you have a chance to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there are companies that are battling for their share of breakfast, battling for their share of lunch, battling for their share of dinner. Hang around with retirees, they eat five meals a day. We have 40 million, well actually we have 68 million American retirees right now, almost all of whom have a mid-afternoon snack. What food company has targeted that? Housing, half of all the home renovations last year were done by people over the age of 50. $90 billion spent, mostly 
to expand their offices, put in a gym, have better light, to be more safe and secure, to have a place where the grandkids can stay. And keep in mind that 81% of people over 65 own their homes, 72% of which are paid off. So even using a metric of income to measure a 30-year-old and a 70-year-old doesn't hold up because that 70-year-old may have no mortgage payments. In fact, is likely to have no mortgage payments. But they might have a house that's got great asset value, but how do they monetize it becomes the issue. Is that Airbnb? Is that reverse mortgages? Is that selling and renting? When we're young, we, build, we buy houses and we live in environments that match who we are. What's going to happen when you have a hundred million or worldwide a billion people who all of a sudden say, where should we live now and why? And instead of how much more can I save, which is one challenge, how can I take what I've got and where could I live to have the best life with that? Leisure and entertainment, all that free time. By the way, I've got Bill O'Reilly, he's having a difficult month. His average viewer is 76 years old. So media companies, Fox was a client of mine, not Fox particularly, but Mr. Murdoch, that was built for white older men. That's a market phenomenon. We have all sorts of things like going back to school, adult education, computer software, theater, culture, arts, learning, VR, virtual reality, travel the world, go volunteer, everywhere in the world. Uh, the world, that's my kooky family on the right there. We were in the Maasai Mara in December. Um, travel is about to get really curious about this sector. Financial services coming alive because of the numbers that I showed you, but retirement planning is about, as Jean so much is pointing out in her book, it's about life. It's about all of the parts of life, and they're not static. This is a new design that Merrill Lynch has come up with in terms of all the different dimensions of our lives. Last point I want to make, show you a quick clip. Uh, the financial implications of an aging population are not solely how will people survive and feel secure, although it's, that's critical. It's what will they give back. I'm going to show you an example, and I show it to you not because you'll necessarily do this, but because I think it's an example of innovation. travel abroad and to interact with native speakers of English. And we're always asking ourselves, how can we make it more real, more human? Give you a big hug. Oh yeah, let's hug. Bye. 
Bye. Yeah, I like that one too. Um, why did I show that? Because I've worked in the gerontology space for uh, 40 something years now, and it's a space of uh, really conscientious, really caring, really giving people. But uh, creativity and entrepreneurialism and imagination is not one of their strengths. And then I interact a lot with investors and business developers who have great mojo for that, but have only a teeny bit of understanding of what maturity will be. So much room for innovation. There's just so much room for innovation. So my summary, we're living in this extraordinary moment in time where increasing longevity is upsurging. Uh, and it behooves all of us to think big, to think futuristic, to think science fiction, to imagine the future, and to help optimize the best parts of it, societally, personally, and otherwise, and to try to find the real thorny parts and avert them far enough in advance that they don't take too many people down. Second, uh, we're having this demographic change at the same time all over the world, so markets are gonna be exploding. We have to revision the way people are gonna be living their lives and who they'll be when they're 60 and 80 and 90, and they need some help as well. And last, there's a marketplace that's emerging unlike anything the world has ever seen, and right now for me it's held back primarily by imagination or the lack of. Thank you. I've called that before. <laughs> I want to start. I, and that was just fascinating. Thank you. you. I know you've been doing this 30 plus years. And one of the things that you said was that this should be, this wave should be the number one issue on the minds of all marketers. So why not? Why isn't it? I think three reasons. Um, first, it's new. Uh, it's really easy to say, okay, let's create another thing for a 22-year-old because everybody's already done that. And it's, so this is new, this is different. And if I'm 27, I might have been 23 already, not too far ago, but I wasn't 70. So how do you do new when it's unfamiliar? Uh, I think the second thing that's been in the way um, is that um, I have to be very careful because I know who our sponsors are here. Um, that there has been a, you know, sometimes you can be too good at talking about how bad aging is. And most people in business have the point of view that older people are desperate and they're vulnerable and they're impoverished. And there are many who are. Um, but that point of view has totally soaked the business community. And so if you sit down with a product developer or an investor and say, let's go after 62-year-olds, other than thinking about you know, falling down and can't get up devices or home care stuff, uh, they generally say, well, there's no money there. Uh, because they've been led to believe that young people have the wealth and older people do not, and that's, that's just wrong. But there is that, that kind of news. And the third point I want to say is the link that I think that holds it together, Gene, that we have to break loose of, is there was this belief when modern marketing emerged in the 1950s and 60s that um, in the early years of life, about 15 to 25, you were forming your identity and, awful, and your brand preferences. And once you decided you were a Buick driver, or you wore English leather cologne, or you were whatever, you were gonna, you know, the gals English were wearing leather. Shalimar back then, <laughs> I don't know, it doesn't probably exist anymore. You would keep that for the rest of your life. And so therefore, you heavy up on attracting young people because that's when they're making their picks and why bother with a 40 or 60 year old because uh, there's nothing new in their life and they'll make no new decisions, which all of us in business know is 100% not true. So you've got this, these reasons that have been holding it back which only makes it more appetizing for you guys or for us because there is so much opportunity, there's so much money in motion and not a lot of, not a comparable level of activity. What, what I think is so interesting and, and you've pointed this out in the research that you did with Merrill Lynch, is that as we watch people move into and through retirement, 
they're, they're showing themselves to be craftier than many experts expected that they would be. So in years where the markets are, are down, they just take one less vacation and they roll with it. And in, in, in times when, when things are a little flusher, they, um, you know, maybe they go on an extra vacation. And, and they've, you called this in the research that you did course corrections. You know, people, people are very agile in, in their ability to switch it up. And I think that's been a surprise. Yeah. Um, Betty Friedan once said to me, I, we're, she and I were on the lecture circuit when her Fountain of Age book came out, and I said to Betty, when you wrote The Feminine Mystique in 1963, what were you thinking? She said, I thought it was time that women were no longer measured by the metric of men, how they could satisfy a man or be like a man. And I said, when you wrote Fountain of Age, what were you thinking? And she says, it's time we stop measuring grown-ups by the metric of youth. Maybe we should measure youth by the metric of maturity. And, you know, that would... I was in Kenya two months ago, and they refer to older people there as elders, and they refer to young people as junior elders. <laughs> so let's think of older people not as kind of incompetent, used to be competent, but they're quite crafty, and they're quite experienced, and they're wise, and they've been through life and death and raised children and seen the world change. And what we saw in our last study, we, we just, uh, you were kind enough to feature it twice on two of your programs. Everybody called me. Gene Chatsky mentioned our study. It's a good study. We got 1.2 billion media impressions so far just on that last study. What we saw was is that when people are contemplating their retirement, they're thinking, you know, maybe I could rent the room out with Airbnb. People are doing that. Or maybe I could relocate to be nearer the grandkids and save $50,000 a year. Maybe I can go back to work for a few years. And all those course corrections are reasonable ways to kind of get there from here. Well, and, and you found something in a, in a study form that I had seen anecdotally, which is when you talk to people who say that they're retired and you ask them what they're doing, they say, well, I'm working. Right? They're, they're, they, they're retired, but it's not, retirement and work are no longer um, different things. It's, it's one of the crazier things because like you said, I'll meet people, what do you do? Oh, I'm retired. Oh, how do you like all that time off? Oh no, I started a company. Or I'm a volunteer 20 hours a week and it's like, well, what's happening is that we had a model of retirement that emerged in the 1930s and let's be clear about it, it was partly designed to give a stipend, a small pension to people when they got older because the poverty level among older people was 35% before Social Security came along. But it was also designed to get them out of the workforce because there was a 25% unemployment level. So young people were stuck. So the decision was let's get the old people out, make room for the young and everybody wins. Today, if you're going to live 80 or 90 years, who can afford to retire at 62? Plus, it's boring. I mean, honestly, I find so many people that unless they find some meaningful connections or they volunteer or they do interest to go back to school, they're just bored. But, but meaning is, is what is so important, I think. And I'm watching my husband, who is older than me, he's, he's 61, sort of wrestle with these thoughts and decisions. And he's not ready to leave his day job quite yet, but he is really thinking about what he could do that he could feel good about. He doesn't want to make no money. Um, and I don't really want him to make no money either, <laughs> quite frankly. But, you know, he he he's searching for meaning in a way that I think a lot of a lot of people are. You know, when my kids who are now 27 and 30, I know we talk your kids in their early 20s. When you're in high school, there's a lot of fanfare given to preparing you to make a de decision for your four years of college. You go visit campuses, you learn about them, they come to your high school and talk, you might go spend a weekend, you go online, you make friends. And yet when we reach 60 or 65, you're basically told Good luck. You know, hope the next 30 years works out. Or when we're young, we make decisions about our life and our career because we want to please our parents. Or we think it's the right technology or job. You know, you know I, I made people say, I decided to be a dentist when I was 17 because I was drunk at a party and I thought it would be a good career. And now I'm 57 and I don't really want to do it anymore. So all of a sudden, you have to think at 50 or 60, who am I now? 
and who would I like to be next? And then there's so many different choices. I think, for example, applications or technologies to help people discover their next trajectory and then how they might afford it and how much work and play can be balanced and what they do with their home asset or their children. Or There's so many choices that uh, I think you're seeing more and more people get with that. I, I, can I ask you a question? I know you're the yeah. professional interviewer. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to dominate. No, no. Um, <laughs> so you, you are in an interesting role because you're not only on the air, right? you're, you have a major voice and you probably hear from people everywhere you go. They say, when you imagine more of us living longer, if you could wave a magic wand, what's the thing you would change so that we could all have a better go of it? Despite the, um, the slide that you put up about how many um, people over 65 have a, a big share of the wealth pie, I get stuck on the statistic, and there have been many of them, about how 50% of people don't have $2,000 that they could access. 50%, there was another study, 50% don't have $400 that they could access. And I think we need to big brother people into doing the right thing because we're not going to do them. And so, you know, forced savings, forced um, uh, planning so that you have some resources so that you can reimagine or reinvent when you get older and you want to do something else. Um, so that, that's part of it. I'd also, I would love to see some more um, systematic sabbaticals throughout life. I, I was with, um, I was in, in Orlando, Florida last weekend um, with a guy who runs a small company and he, he, he told me, um, one of my favorite things to do when I go to a new city is find somebody local to go for a run with, because then I find the best running trail. So I went for a run with this guy. We were talking about his business and what he does, and he said, you know, a, a couple years ago, I started this program where I told my employees they could have a 40-hour sabbatical. And they could do whatever they wanted, and I would pay them, and they just had to come back and report on it. And people did amazing things. They, they one studied beer, one studied trees, I, it, but I, I do think giving people time throughout life where they could explore and figure out where their head is would be valuable. What do you think about, you mentioned it, uh, and, and I share your, by the way, I would tell you that I, when I look at the levels of obesity in this country compared to other developed nations, and we're off the charts, and a low level of longevity compared to other countries, uh, and the high levels of debt and low levels of savings. I worry that even though I, I mean, I love being an American, I love having so much choice, but I worry that giving people the responsibility to save on their own, and it's your own for, I think we're, we're going to see tens of millions of people heading for a rough ride. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree, and I. I was, and, and AARP did a, a significant amount of work on the plans that were emerging from the states to um, put IRAs into small companies and make them automatic in the ways that 401k are automatic. And it doesn't look like that will happen with this new administration. And so, you know, I, I think that, um, I agree. I think that where possible, we should incentivize people to do the right thing and even better just automate them into doing it and then let them feel good about the fact that they did it. I agree. But the idea of enforced or mandated savings like they have in countries, Australia, New Zealand, other countries, do you think we'd ever get there in this country? Um, not right now. Yeah. What, um, <laughs> can I ask you one other question? Sure. Um, you, you mentioned sort of your astonishment at becoming 52. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, 50 was, was astonishing, but 52, I'm sort of over it. Do you think of it as an ascent or a descent? I think it 
it's an, I don't think of it as a descent. I don't know that I think of it as an ascent either. I feel like I have good years and bad years, and they just sort of good weeks and bad weeks, and it's just a ride. Um, what, Yeah, I, I don't think I think of it. I mean, I'm an optimist in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I also don't sit and think about, well, I'm going to do this when I'm 62, or I'm going to do this when I'm 65. I, um, in part, I think because I lost my father young, I want to get it in. Um, but part of getting it in is continuing to work. And, and I, think, I think that's going to be an interesting part of the, of the progression. People um, my age, and, and I, I came, out of, um, came out of college in 1986. I think my colleagues, co cohort, we are very wrapped up in our careers. And I, and I don't think we're going to let them go so easily. I mean, what do you think? Are you an ascent or a descent person? Honestly or like Honestly. media version? Um, <laughs> I lost my mom this last year. I'm and sorry. She, yeah, uh, she died in 93. She had Alzheimer's. She died in my brother in our arms. So it was sort of beautiful. Um, and. Um, I'm more keenly aware that there's an end point, that there's so many more summers, or that there might be only so many more peak experiences to be had. So that's, when I was a young man writing about aging, I didn't hold that as rich, the emotionality of loss and fear of going to the doctor and seeing friends get, it's like dodgeball, you got a good friend, all of a sudden, boom, you know, <laughs> down. And, um, I would have to say that physically it's a challenge to keep it ascending because it's a lot more work and scarier. Uh, but I would have to say in terms of wisdom and kind of understanding and I feel like it's a total ascent. Yeah. So, um, and yes, but the ride of life, like you say, ups, downs, up, you know, in and out and around, but I do feel that uh, I feel more an intensity about doing the things that I think are really important and getting them done, like this field, like hopefully sparking you guys to innovate and come up with ideas that will transform people's lives, than just knocking around and making money or doing other things. I feel like the importance, the, the juiciness, the, the value of life just feels more profound compared to when I was younger. And I think that's something that people get to experience in their rebound careers after quote unquote retirement. I think, I think that when, when we're involved in making money and paying off the mortgage and putting our kids through college and it is, it's, it's very tough for most people for it not to be a slog. But after those things are satisfied, then you can, you can be a little more flexible with it. You can choose to earn a little less to do something that you really want to do. And, and that, that's pretty freeing. I would add, and I know we've only got a couple of minutes to your point about making savings more automatic. Um, since I know a lot of you are ton of, kind of tech leaning, um, uh, I use ways when yeah, I have to get too. places. So I like, where do I want to be? And then it sort of calculates. It's got algorithms based on the amount of traffic, the time of day, the speed of my car. Tra and it, it, I don't have to think about it. It works it out. I would like to have a life ways so that I could just sort of plug in. Here I am. I got this amount of money. I got, by the way, it's not just my income, but maybe my home is worth, pick a number. You might have no money to spend, but your home is worth $500,000. So how do you, so I'd like to have a life ways and have something that keeps me on track. Because what I think is missing for so many people is not only the information, but the discipline. Keep your hand on the rudder. Um, so I would like to have tech that's not a bit or a piece, here's a good credit card or here's a way to you know, max out your, you know, your retirement plan. But I'd like to have a master plan 
with some, maybe it's IBM's Watson that's gonna do it one day, where I just say, here, hey, it's me, it's Ken again, and they say, all right, this is what you gotta be doing so you can get to the dream life you wanna have. Well, and that's what, that's what financial planners do, right? That's what the, that person, if you have the right person on your team, does for you. They sit down and, and they model it out, and if you spend this much, you get here, and if you spend a little more, then you're in the red, and, and they, they model it. I, I think we're close. I mean, the, the, the app that I'm most in love with right now is called Digit, and it, um, it, it has a smart back end that looks at the amount that you have in your checking account and the amount that you're spending, and it saves for you. It figures out how much you can afford to save, and then it moves the money so that you don't spend it, so it's out of your account. And, and people who are using it are saving thousands of dollars that they would have just frittered away on other things. But it needs, you're right, it needs to be bigger and more robust and more all encompassing. And the financial community, we know at early decades in our life we're accumulating and then you know you reach 60 or whatever and it's a terrible word, but decumulation. Right. So is this software also help you know which of your resources to spend and when, when you're no longer earning? There are a couple of companies here today that are focused on that. Great. So, yeah, so we're counting on you. <laughs> Any final advice you'd give uh, these folks or maybe you and I as they try to make a business out of a need? I think, I think get in front of, I mean, what I like most about this event is it's not just um, presenters and it's not just people who are pitching, it's actual potential consumers. And so I think, I mean, when I, when I travel the country as you do, I get the most value out of my Q&A sessions with audiences because they teach me what they're interested in. I think that that's, you, gotta, you have to keep listening to the people who might need your product. And you? Yeah, I would say uh, don't design for yesterday's version of aging. Uh, and don't call me a senior, I'm not a senior. I will never be a senior, nor will any baby boomer be a senior. Everybody has done, everybody of research says we respect that our parents' generation, when I got in the field, older people referred to themselves as golden agers. I'm not making that up. And then the seniors word came along and it was kind of cooler and hip and more modern. But I use that as a metaphor. Design for tomorrow's 60 year old, 70 year old, 90 year old, and don't jump over 50 to 70. Often when people think of their designing or creating for maturity, I listen, and I've been listening to ideas and pitches for 40 years and been involved in a lot of multi-billion dollar businesses around these. People somehow, when you say maturity, they go right to 75, 80 year olds. There's a whole lot of people driving cars, buying homes, taking vacations, managing their kids, redoing their hair, going to the gym, that are in their 50s and 60s, and they don't think of themselves as old people. Don't leave that out. Don't just go to the elder side of the equation. And pay particular attention to the women. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you.